My name is Suzanne Papp. I'm the Director of the Teaching, Learning, and Professional Development Center. On behalf of the, the Department of Psychology and the Honors College, the TLPC, <laughs> it's my privilege today to welcome you and to thank you for joining us. Today we have a treat as we listen to our provost, Dr. Bob Smith, talk about his book um, and talk about its relationship to learning and leadership. So would you join me in welcoming Provost Smith? Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. I'm very, very pleased to be here. All of you should have a little brochure. Uh, we know you're not in Fortaleza or Recife, Brazil, but uh, <laughs> last, the last two weeks I had a chance to make this presentation, and we had some brochures. We printed up enough brochures so that uh, we could share them with you. And I'm purposely sharing what I shared with high school students in Brazil in the last two weeks because one of the purposes of the presentation today is to get feedback, particularly from faculty and students, as to how appropriate you think this material is uh, for undergraduates coming into the university. Uh, I'm planning uh, next year uh, that if I'm going to try to do some first year experience courses. And, uh, you know, it's a conflict of interest for me to say to students, you know, you have to take this course and you have to use my book. Uh, what I would propose to do if you think it's appropriate material, I would buy books for the students. And so whoever signed up, we would get those books to them. So, uh, but I just value your feedback. So I hope we'll have plenty of time at the end for that. And I'll try to keep my remarks to about 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, again, thank you for being here. Um, I want to thank Juan Munoz, of course, who helps us in this whole area of uh, teaching, learning, and professional development. Uh, Suzanne, of course, who works diligently to make sure these programs are interesting and informative and, and hopefully enjoyable as well. Uh, for the immediate future, we want to consider the way of Oz, the stories, the author, the, the messages. And the primary message today is this place, event, and time uh, learning, leadership, and career advancement of student scholars of all ages uh, is what we want to consider today. And as I always tell students, uh, uh, this will never happen again. This is a, a great experience for all of us to be here at this time to, to think about some of these uh, topics. Uh, the Way of Oz is really a, a book on personal and professional development. The, the, the book, the store, or rather the messages in the book uh, come out of the stories uh, of Oz. By the way, how many people have seen the 1939 film with Judy Garland? Usually I get a good show of hands. How about the 1900 book that L. Frank Baum wrote, uh, published in 1900? Uh, good. Uh, it sold, by the way, 39,000 copies in the first few months. The Way of Oz hasn't done nearly as well as it has. <laughs> so uh, today, uh, Frank Baum would have been a best-selling author. Uh, he probably was then as well. But uh, it's about personal professional developments, building out of the, the story, the basic story of The Wizard of Oz, both as it's portrayed in the first book and uh, in the 39 film. Also, uh, how many people know that there are sequels to the original Oz story? Well, a lot of people. And in fact, there were 13 sequels. So he, um, he wrote many, many sagas. There were actually others after he died that wrote sequels as well, but most notably uh, uh, Ruth Plumey Thompson. But uh, the, the sequels are important too because the characters uh, play out uh, much more extensively in the sequels. So what I'm going to focus on today principally are two characters uh, in the book. Uh, one, of course, is the, the Scarecrow, which uh, represents learning and wisdom. Uh, the Tin Woodman represents a heart and loving. Uh, the Cowardly Lion representing serving and courage. And then Dorothy, she's the, the leadership person. She's the focus on the future. And the wizard I play as humility and related virtues. It may seem a little odd to make out the wizard as a virtuous person in any way, shape, or form, but it actually, we all know that he was humiliated in the original book and the film. But in the sequels, uh, he becomes a truly no noble and humble servant, uh, primarily because of Glinda's good witch of the South. Uh, Glinda works with him and he becomes a, a, a true servant. We're, only, we're going to focus mostly on the Scarecrow and Dorothy 
as they relate to learning and leadership. So in essence then we'll start with a, just a brief overview of the story and its creator and then we'll get into learning and wisdom exploring what I call this whiz whiz aphorism where you stand is where you sit. We'll see more about that in a moment. Views of the landscape. Talking a little bit about reading, writing, and speaking, the communication skills. I'm delighted we have some students from media and communication. And then under the Dorothy section, we'll talk about uh, Dorothy's, the modern Dorothy. And I love to talk about the modern Dorothy because women are doing so well in higher education now. I think some of you know that uh, in higher education nationally, women make up about 60% of undergraduates currently. And if you only have to go to a few commencements, I've been to at least a dozen of them since I've been here, and you see the women overwhelmingly winning the awards and getting the summa cum laude. So women are doing very, very well. So that's the idea in the book, not to denigrate men in any way. In fact, men could take some lessons from women these days, I think, because the, the women are doing so well. And I suggest that the modern Dorothy is going to be successful if she's involved in planning and diversity, sustainability, an understanding of science for everyone, and then personal responsibility, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I'll just mention uh, Toto. Uh, in the original book, he was a mongrel. Uh, in the film, you know, he was a corn terrier. But in the sequels, he was a French bulldog. And uh, uh, that was John Neal's work. And my wife and I have had five French bulldogs. And so the French bulldog in the book is patterned after Monsieur Hercule Poirot, our very first French bulldog. <laughs> Uh, a little bit about, about the Oz story uh, and its creator, uh, starting with the book, I mentioned the 1900 book. This is the uh, title page of the first book. Uh, it was published in Chicago in 1900, in the fall of 1900. Uh, the film many people know about. It's a classic archetypal tale of uh, people that go out and uh, challenge uh, adverse elements in their lives, overcome those challenges, grow with those challenges, and come back empowered uh, into their uh, native place. So for Dorothy, she comes back to what is portrayed as uh, Kansas. Uh, Dorothy, of course, and leadership is a, is a nice uh, connection, as we mentioned. There are lessons in all of the characters. One of the lessons that comes out throughout the book and throughout the stories is this notion of power from within. Uh, I had a chance to, I've had a chance to, to make this presentation in various Catholic schools and what I reflect upon with students is that I went to parochial school myself, was the St. Pancras School in Glendale, New York, years, many more years than I'd like to admit. And the sisters had a very good uh, lesson for us. They would always say to us as young Catholic uh, children, uh, pray as though it all depends on God, but work as though it all depends on you. <laughs> and to me, that's really the, the Star Wars thing, the power within us, the idea that you, 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 can't, you don't necessarily have to count on anything else, you have to bring that power up from yourself. And I'll say more about that a little later. Uh, it's a, the whole idea of a real adventure versus a dream. Uh, in the book, of course, it was a real adventure. Oz was a real place. This is a map of Oz. Uh, that was drawn originally by Professor Wogglebug. Uh, he's a character in some of the sequels, uh, supposedly uh, written by him, but it's actually developed, of course, by Frank Baum. But there were four major countries in Oz. Winky Country is where the Wicked Witch of the West was. Munchkin Country, where the Wicked Witch of the East. Uh, Gilligan Country was the Good Witch of the North. Uh, you don't hear much about the Good Witch of the North. She was a very kind of dowdy-looking character and in the book, she's the one that comes in Munchkin Company, in c Country, when Dorothy first lands in Oz. And she's the one that says, you've got to get on the yellow brick road. It's not, it's not Glinda. Uh, in fact, it, the, the movie distorts this because they call uh, Glinda the Good Witch of the North. That's a northern bias uh, in making the film. She really was the Good Witch of the South. And Glinda is quite beautiful. And uh, there's colors associated with the various countries. Green country is blue, Gilligan is purple, Winky is yellow, and Quadling is uh, a ruby red. And of course, the rubies are used like the emeralds are used in the Emerald City uh, in Quadling. Uh, uh, 
the, uh, the slippers or the shoes that Dorothy wears, in the book, they, of course, they were silver. There was a great interest in precious <coughs> metals in the 19th century, in part because of uh, their backing of uh, US currency. Uh, but when they made the film with the yellow brick road, silver doesn't show up so well against uh, uh, yellow, so they made them ruby red. There were six pairs that were, were crafted. Uh, one is in the uh, National uh, uh, American History Museum in Washington, D.C., part of the Smithsonian. I was there a couple of years ago, and it's one of the most fascinating uh, exhibits to anybody. People come and flock around, have their pictures taken with these ruby slippers. Uh, one pair sold at auction in the year 2000, about $600,000. So uh, they were pretty expensive uh, shoes. There's 13 sequels from 1904 to 1920. Uh, Baum uh, didn't necessarily want to write sequels, but after he had published the first book, kid, children wrote to him and said, we want to know more about Dorothy, we want to know more about Oz. So he kept writing them. He tried to do a lot of different things, as I'll mention in a minute, uh, throughout to his life. But he kept coming back to the Oz sequels in part because the children and his readers uh, asked him to do that. There are some very interesting, uh, oh, I, mentioned, I should have mentioned settings. Oz, by the way, is not in Kansas. What? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Oz comes from, the depiction of Oz uh, in the book comes from Aberdeen, South Dakota, where, uh, where uh, Frank Baum and his family lived from 1888 to 1891. <coughs> He went out there, as many New Yorkers did, by the way. <coughs> Those of you who have an interest in the state of New York, many New Yorkers went out to the, the great Midwest because the railroads were developing and it was very prosperous in parts of the Midwest. And he spent about three years in Aberdeen, South Dakota, uh, partly as a printer and publisher and partly as a merchant. And uh, when he was printing and publishing, he did a column that uh, sort of made fun of his, the townsfolk. And he then used some of those caricatures in the later books, and he didn't want to embarrass his former neighbors, so he put the uh, put the Oz story in Kansas. He spent very little time in Kansas in his life, because uh, he was an actor, as we'll see in a moment. He did he did star in a show in Lawrence, Kansas, one time, but uh, it's it's mostly about South Dakota as the setting, which looked a lot like uh, Western Kansas, by the way. Uh, those of you who don't know the South Dakota topography. So there were 13 sequels. There are also some very interesting futuristic elements in the sequels. Glinda has a magic record where she can open up a book and find out what's going on all over Oz. Ozma, who appears as the queen of Oz late in the sequels, has a magic picture that's like the internet. So he had some prescient notions of, of future developments. That he does draw upon utopian uh, literature by uh, Edward Bellamy and William Morris wrote books at that time were very, very popular. And this whole idea of defeating despots and reflecting American optimism appears very, very much uh, in the sequel. A little bit about Frank Baum. He was, he was christened Lyman Frank Baum. He hated the name Lyman. He never used it. He used it L. Frank Baum. At one, when he was an actor, he went by Lewis uh, Frank Baum. Uh, he was an American polymath. Look at these things that he did. He was an actor, a breeder of rare chickens. In fact, his first book was really a composite of several papers he had written about raising chickens, and uh, it actually supposedly was published without him uh, knowing it, and uh, that was his uh, first uh, involvement uh, in work. He was a director, he was a, a gardener, a lyricist, a merchant, a movie producer, a flatalist, a photographer, a playwright, a printer, publisher, salesman, theater manager, window dresser, and celebrated author. He published over 60 books in his lifetime. Many outside of the, the, the Oz genre wrote things for young children, young boys and young girls. And one thing that's very characteristic of L. Frank Baum, and he's really somewhat underrated, is he threw himself into everything that he did. Uh, when he was raising chickens, he helped found the uh, New York Poultry Society, and he became the secretary of that society. When he was in Aberdeen, South Dakota as a merchant, he started a minor league baseball team and started a baseball league and was the secretary of that group. When he was uh, in Chicago and he was selling glassware and china, he got into window dressing to help the people that he was selling those wares to, and he founded a window dressing society and created a journal and made quite a bit off the journal for several weeks, several years before he became a celebrated author. So literally that notion of getting involved, outreach, 
what we typically call service learning or s service in general was very, very much a part of this uh, 19th century person's uh, life. Also, there's a very important influence of place on everything that he did. He started out in New York in Chittenango, uh, which is uh, very close to Syracuse. He lived in Syracuse. He grew up in Syracuse. He went to school in Poughkeepsie for a couple of years. Uh, he lived in South Dakota, as I mentioned. He was in Chicago from about uh, 1891 to 1908. He had a, a summer home. He called it the sign of the goose because he did Father Goose and Mother Goose books. Uh, and he made enough money on them to build this lavish uh, vacation home on Lake Michigan. And then, of course, his last years of his life was at Oscott, which was this uh, home in Hollywood, California. Uh, after he'd gone bankrupt and pretty much his wife took over the finances after the bankruptcy because he was not very good with money. And he sort of, that idea of throwing yourself into things, he'd start up projects not realizing how much they might cost and got himself into trouble a couple of times. <clears throat> so, uh, moving on then to the notion of learning and wisdom and the Scarecrow character. Uh, some of you are aware of this book that came out a few years ago called Where You Stand is Where You Sit, an Academic Administrator's Handbook. The idea being that where you stand, how, what positions you have on things, on policy, on the institution you work in, has a lot to do with where you sit in that organization. And delightful th one of the, the delightful things about being a provost is you have a chance to look at the entire landscape of the university and to understand it, and, or at least attempt to understand it. That's really part of your job. But I also say, and expand it in the, in the Oz book, to say, well, where you stand is where you sit is important, but it's also where you travel and what you experience in travel, what you read, what you write, what you say, and then what it feels like to bring all of these elements of the aphorism together. I want to say a little bit more about each of those. Where you stand is where you sit has a lot to do with the landscape. Uh, and if I were teaching undergraduates in a beginning course, I would say, you know, you ought to understand the landscape, its economic, geographic, personal, political, and professional and social elements. So when we look at Texas, we ought to know the states and the country to our south around us. We ought to have some sense of the congressional districts and the political system in the state. We ought to understand what the topography looks like. We could take a, and look at a diversity. Uh, we have those kinds of maps that help us. And then we ought to be able to pick out Texas on the world map. But it seems to me that that's sort of a basic understanding that all people wanting to be good citizens in, in the world should have some sense of. And what, as you do things like this, you start to defeat what I call parochialism or refer to as parochialism. I don't know how many meetings I've sat in over the last 40 years or so in higher education and somebody will get up in a faculty senate meeting, for example, and say, well, in the chemistry department, this is what we do. Well, that's okay for the chemistry department, but how about the sociology department? How about the, the music theory department? Or whatever department's out there. And then having that larger and larger perspective that you can relate to. And I suggest for young people is volunteer work can help here, and particularly with agencies with broad missions. Uh, Part-time employment, recreation and hobbies may help. And then the, also developing higher education, goals, including lifelong learning. And I believe the, the 21st century will be the century of self-learning. And we're seeing all this with the MOOCs now, with all the kinds of movements that we're seeing, flipping classrooms, the idea that students and all of us can learn a lot on our own, and the teachers and the mentors just should be helping to guide those opportunities. One of the things that's been so wonderful in my own life is I've had great opportunities to work abroad. And uh, a lot of these opportunities don't come by themselves. Uh, what I've, when, you, when I've served as a, an administrative officer in various institutions, and people would start up projects and they were doing certain things, I would simply say to them, if you would like me to help at some point, or if it makes sense for me to, to give a talk in a particular setting and so forth, I'd be happy to do that. And that's what got me to all of these countries essentially, or where I actually wrote a proposal, got a grant to do something. So I've done things in, uh, like done work for the Ministries of Health in Bolivia and Ecuador many years ago. I've been in Brazil the last <coughs> two years. I was the external examiner for a couple of years in the pharmacy school in Malaysia. 
Uh, I've done work in Russia with uh, joint programs, uh, one at uh, Vladivostok at Far Eastern State University in environmental science and one in Moscow on chemistry. <coughs> so you have these kinds of opportunities, but you have to kind of make those opportunities. And then you want to maximize everything that you learn from those opportunities, <coughs> getting there, being there, serving there, learning here, trying to learn as much as you can. That's in the book. Try to learn as much as you can before you go so you can ask intelligent questions and probing questions. People are happy to do that. And when you work on projects, then you're typically working with people in country. They'll have a lot to share with you. You can learn an awful lot uh, from them. And I love this quote from Evan Schwartz who wrote a biography of Frank Bannel. It was very important for him. There's one surefire way of finding one's inner self and bark when the time comes on the journey. Frank and his wife, Maud, and I didn't mention Maud, and I didn't mention Matilda. Let me go back to that for a moment. Frank and, and Maud did go on an international trip in 1906. They had enough money at that time from the things that he had done. And they went to Gibraltar. They went to uh, Italy. They went to France. And they went to Egypt. And uh, it's this obvious productivity that came out of that. He was one of his only novels for adults. I think he called it the Egyptian, came out of that particular uh, program, of that particular uh, journey, as it were. It was about a, a actually a two-month journey at that time. So journeys have a, a, a powerful effect on us. Uh, Maud was there mostly to enjoy herself, although she did write a, a diary that he published later on with uh, several of his pictures. He was quite a good photographer and uh, distributed that to friends and relatives. Where you travel has a lot, to, a lot of impact on people. I don't know how many times uh, I talk to students after they've studied abroad on uh, how impactful this appears to be. Students will literally say, this changed my life. Uh, I can't imagine any other experience that would have changed my life more. And I just want to share, uh, some of you know that in the book we have the QR codes. I'm sorry I didn't bring a copy with me. And it, the QR codes allow you to download the videos from the website and to see videos that relate to uh, things that we're talking about in the book. And in the section in the book on learning and specifically traveling and studying abroad, we have a, uh, a video of uh, Seth and Jessica. And Ching, if we could uh, now switch to that and just show that very short video. It's only about three minutes. Just to give you an example, there are 13 videos linked into the book. I first studied abroad in the spring of 2009 in the Texas Tech Civil Center in Spain. And uh, I just originally went wanting to learn Spanish and become fluent. And once I got there, I kind of got hooked on travel and study abroad. So when I came back, I was focused on foreign languages. I ended up studying abroad two more times, once in Cairo and again in Brazil. I went to Cairns and then Cairns I did the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I went to Sydney and got a walk in the Opera House, that was really awesome. I did Melbourne, I did Tasmania, Fiji, and I was uh, located in Brisbane for school. So I saw a lot of the East Coast of Australia. I could show pictures of the pyramids and Eiffel Tower, and, but like the monuments and the th things you see while you're by, that's really secondary to the like I guess the intellectual journey that you take while you're abroad and that's um, I think if you do it right that's the true goal of study abroad. You learn so much about yourself when you're abroad. Um, I was an independent student you know my parents didn't pamper me they didn't come with me I didn't have any friends that went with me and you learn a lot about yourself when you do go abroad. It's something that's impacted my life greatly in a lot of different areas and I think it has the potential to do that to anyone who studies abroad so I promote it as much as I can. I think it's an inter interesting idea that students go thousands of miles away from everything they know to actually learn more about themselves. I think that's an interesting idea, but it's true. I, I could not have written this for <laughs> It's perfect, and uh, do I need to do something to switch back? Let me switch back. Thank you. Uh, so Seth Sartain just graduated, <coughs> as did Jessica this last year. Seth was actually here this last summer helping us with the Brazilian students who visited uh, 
we had a program for them. We're going to have another one this summer. Uh, he's a Spanish and chemistry major and teaches now in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I hope someday he'll be teaching in our Brazil program. So he's a wonderful, wonderful young man and wonderful language skills. Uh, okay, so it's where you travel, what you experience in travel. So it has something that's a lot to do with what you read. And uh, I had an English professor uh, back in St. John's when I was an undergraduate, gave a lecture uh, in, a, uh, in a, uh, an auditorium uh, while I was there. This might have been 1962, if you can believe this. And his name was Blaise Opulente. And uh, Blaise went on to become provost at St. John's. But he had something he called Opulente's prescriptions. He said that if you really want to have an enriched life, you have to have an interdisciplinary orientation, and you have to be involved in lifelong learning. And part of the lifelong learning should be reading and rereading seminal books. And uh, the, uh, uh, all of us know the great seminal books. But I also suggest it's important to look at modern classics. Uh, I love Carl Sagan's Dragons of Eden. I've read it two or three times. Uh, Joseph Campbell I've read a couple of times. And uh, E.O. Wilson's Consilience. Uh, these two, by the way, won uh, Pulitzer Prizes when they first came out. Uh, th these are important books to read and reread. And then I also suggest to students that uh, setting and integrating reading, writing, and speaking goals, so many books per year you ought to set out to do. I try to do 12 to 24 books a year. I don't always get accomplished, but uh, most times I do. And uh, these are some of the books I've been reading relative to background. And, Rob and I love this book, Devil in the White City. Some of you know it's about a sociopathic killer and uh, all the great people that put together the Columbia Exposition of 1893. It's a wonderful, wonderful book by Eric Larson, a Seattle uh, author. Uh, some of the other things that I've written about or read about, uh, Stolen Words is a great book on plagiarism. And so these are important for short and long-term goals. I do have a database that's been in place for, since 1985. I take notes in everything that I read that I think is worthwhile, and we have them transcribed and put into a database so that literally when you want to write something, you can mine your own mind. Uh, in essence, uh, there are things in there going back 25 years, and I surprised myself what I had read. Uh, I, I used to work for a pharmacist, Bob Gasser, who said, it scares me sometimes what we have in our inventory. Well, <laughs> it may scare you sometimes what's in the inventory in your mind uh, in some way or another, if you can just tweak it out. Uh, and then on trying to understand the human condition, the natural world, and the power of archetypes, irony, metaphors, and stories. I love campus, campus common reading programs. We've been doing this on a volunteer basis at Tech for several years. We're going to try to expand it, Suzanne, next year, as I think you, you well know. And uh, By the way, I didn't mention Dusty Higgins. Dusty Higgins is the great artist that did all the cartooning. And Dusty and I worked together like Baum and W.W. W. Denslow worked together where we have some ideas. He'll read, the, he'll read the manuscript and then come up with some characters and he'll give you options and you kind of tweak them. And so there's uh, some perhaps some mistakes on my part as well in there, but clearly he's the artist, he's the one uh, who has, has created uh, these wonderful characters. Then of course what you write is very important. Uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, Mill said, you know, unless you nail things down in words, uh, uh, it, it really doesn't uh, hold them fast for the rest of uh, uh, posterity. I, I like Joan Didion, the 20th century uh, novelist said, I don't even, I don't even know what I think until I write it down. And Amy Tan, the, the great uh, Asian American novelist, said writing is a way of making sense of the world. Uh, I often suggest to people that uh, if you really want to learn something about a topic, write a book about it. And it's actually, that, that's not glib. I mean, that's, you can, anybody can do that today. Because you can publish your own works, as many authors did, even some famous authors uh, told that John Grisham started with his books in the back of his car in Mississippi. Uh, there's many, many examples like this. And, and But I say that one of the most important things about writing a book or a paper or an article is it helps you organize your own thinking. And I couldn't give this presentation if I hadn't read, read a book, written a book about it, because it's forced me to learn so much about this idea that I'm, I'm proposing to people. So these are some of the things that I've written over the years. And, uh, been great help to me. There is a question mark on graduate research. We have a fourth edition that Lou Densmore and I worked on. We have a student of uh, Lou's here, and hopefully, University of Washington Press will publish it next year. 
Uh, what you say is important in terms of communication and teaching. Uh, I think AT&T stole this from Maya Angelou. I learned every day you have to reach out and touch someone. You might remember that old uh, ad that AT&T was using. I love what Harold Rosen says, that to actively seek what others need. Harold is, a, uh, is the son of a Jewish father and a Catholic mother. And he wound up being the Baha'i coordinator uh, a Baha'i faith coordinator in British Columbia. That's what he does today. He's also a philosopher. Uh, and he says that you, what you learn from people is constantly actively seeking what they need. Psychologists know this well uh, when they have their initial visits with people. And uh, the opposite of that, of course, uh, this is a portrayal of uh, or derivative of a New Yorker cartoon from many years ago. Uh, where you have somebody that's obviously been blabbing about themselves for the last half hour or so, and they get to a point and say, well, that's enough about me. What do you think about me? Well, here's what they think of that. And that's uh, Dusty's portrayal of that cartoon. So developing speaking skills and styles uh, to interact well with people is important. Integrating your communication. And then I say adding drama and intrigue. Uh, you can do this with art, you can do it with other objects, you can do it with sartorial <coughs> accessories. A lot of people know about neckties that I love. And the bio tapestry tie helped me get two jobs. I use the, the analogy that you remember the Normans came from the east to England and conquered England, and they didn't integrate well with, with the English countryside and the people in the countryside. In fact, Alistair Cook, who did this wonderful story, wonderful uh, program years ago called The Story of English. He said, you know, had the Normans interacted with the English in a more favorable way today, we'd probably all be speaking French. Uh, but that was not the case. So uh, the idea of interacting well and coming from the East and avoiding that business. When I, when I went from Connecticut to Arkansas to apply for the provost job, I wore the bio tapestry tie and said, you can bet I will interact well with the faculty, <laughs> students, and staff. And it turned out when I came here, I was still coming from the east, so I used the same story. So it, it's been a very good time for me. So what does it feel like to bring all these things together, the power of your experiences, uh, uh, where you travel, what you've read, what you've spoken? Uh, what does it have to do with lifelong learning and integrating learning? I say integrating learning with caring and serving, and I'll emphasize this point a little bit. Uh, the notion that of learning versus wisdom. Learning is not wisdom. There are a lot of, uh, my friend uh, Bob Sternberg says, there are a lot of crackpot despots who were very learned. <laughs> Stalin and Hitler were very learned, but they didn't care about anybody. And if you don't care, you don't serve people well, uh, then you don't really have wisdom. And so that's really important. And then having a focus on the future uh, with humility and related virtues, all with ethics in the lead. And uh, also remembering that there are other factors that influence your learning. Mixing vocational and avocational pursuits. Here's Dusty's uh, portrayal of Alexander Bourdin. Bourdin was a great chemist in the 19th century, but he was probably more famous as a composer, as our good friend from the music school knows. Uh, his third symphony that I gather was, uh, was actually completed maybe by Prokofiev, if I remember correctly, and another collaborator. But his uh, print, music to Prince Igor, the Palavetsian dances, wonderful, wonderful music that he composed uh, being, and, and being a chemist primarily. Charles Ives is a similar story. Uh, he was actually an insurance man. He lived in western Connecticut. He worked in Manhattan, took the train down to Manhattan every day. Actually ran a school for insurance agents. But at the same time, when he go back to Darien, Connecticut, uh, hearing the chaos and hearing the bands and hearing all the different music and juxtaposed to different other uh, noises in society literally came up with this very avant-garde 20th century music that really set a pattern for a lot of modern music in the 20th century. I also suggest that personal environmental scanning is very important. Uh, this is sort of a portrayal of that constantly looking at your landscape and seeing where there are opportunities, particularly for selective volunteerism. If you're going to volunteer for things, why not find some voluntary efforts that will help you learn in a special way? And here's the example of the person, the staff member working in a nonprofit organization, realizing that writing and getting grants is very important, and an opportunity comes up where you volunteer to be the principal investigator on a grant. You'll learn a lot uh, doing that. Uh, of course, teaching and self-reinforcing love of learning. I think in the 21st century, we're all teachers. 
uh, whether you're a staffer, whether you're a faculty member, uh, whether you're working in industry, we're all learning from one another. So the art of teaching and the love of teaching is very important, continuing education. Developing intellectual, emotional, and behavioral integrity, particularly being able to deal with rejection. And then uh, all of the above uh, supporting lifelong learning. One other thing is the power of place in learning. I just finished reading uh, Susan Vreeland's book, The Luncheon of the Voting Party. It's the story of how uh, Pierre Auguste Renoir created this painting. And how I reflect on this in the book is, uh, I don't know if you know Michael Franks, he's a great uh, 20th century jazz composer uh, and performer. And in one of his uh, songs, he says, I lived in a painting by Renoir. Well, if you lived in a painting by Renoir, you might want to live in this painting, because this is at the Maison Farnese, uh, only a few miles west of Paris. It's on a little island in the Seine uh, where boaters used to go. And these are all his friends. Uh, and you can learn all about how they got into the painting and how they interacted. And I see this also as a metaphor for what happens at meetings, where you have reflection, where you have interactions one-on-one, -on -one, among three or four people at the same time. Uh, this is Aileen, uh, who eventually became uh, Renoir's wife, uh, interacting with her doggy. And so that whole idea of that dynamism in learning, that dynamism of being in place, that dynamism of interacting with others, very, very powerful. Uh, and then the caring. And when you learn more about this painting and the characters in it, they did care for one another. They did interact in very favorable work, uh, ways. The painting was actually created over two months' time on Sunday afternoons. And uh, Louise Fournays, the owner, along with her husband, served them lunch. And then they would, they would pose for this painting. So it's a wonderful, wonderful story. So the idea of active learning and caring and service and that's why we emphasize internship, service learning, study abroad, and undergraduate research in terms of, of learning. This painting, by the way, is in the Phillips collection in Washington, D.C. Mr. Phillips bought it in 1923. I suspect it's worth tens of millions of dollars now if we're up on auction. You can see it there. I go, every time I go to D.C., I try to get to see this painting. Uh, it's about a six by four. It's a beautiful, beautiful painting. Okay. Now the uh, Dorothy and the focus on the future. Uh, planning is one of those components with a focus on the future. John Galsworthy, the great English playwright, said if you don't think about the future, you can't have one. Uh, so the idea of integrating learning and scholarship, that personal environmental scanning and selective volunteerism, having a lot to do with personal planning. The role of teachers and mentors, we sort of portrayed uh, the Tin Woodman as a, a mentor here, people who really care about you, who really care about your holistic development, and then that connection of learning with wisdom, caring, and service, and commitments to lifelong learning. Very important in terms of personal planning. In terms of institutional planning, uh, where whatever you do, you'll get involved in planning relative to institutions. Uh, I love what uh, Yogi Berra said, the future ain't what it used to be. I often say the future ain't what it used to be, isn't it? Uh, it clearly is different than we might have, what it would have predicted. Uh, institutional planning is important and fighting cynicism is important. We had a, uh, a graphic in an earlier book about here's this woman taking me the, the reports from the planning, just sticking them in the stacks to collect uh, cobwebs and dust. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to know about the, the, mid, the vision, the mission, the environmental context, the goals and objectives, having oversight groups and shared understanding. Uh, and having benchmark and periodic reports, all are very important elements in institutional planning. And that's what the modern Dorothy has to know about. Uh, she also needs to know about diversity. Uh, this is a portrayal of some ideas about diversity. I use the mosaic metaphor about uh, diversity for people, places, and ideas. Uh, all of us have seen great uh, uh, mosaics. Uh, this happens to be a portrayal of one in the Musi Capitoline in, uh, in Rome. And what strikes you about mosaics uh, is when you get very close to them, you have, you're very conscious of differences, conscious of different textures, different sizes, different shapes, different colors. But as you pull back, you realize that they've come together in a very, very special way. And they come together because of the mortar. 
uh, brings them together in a special way through the, the work and the creativeness of the artist, of course. And then the, the notion of the mosaic is, and I use the German word gestalt, the total effect of the mosaic is, if you can do this, if you can bring differences together in a very beautiful way, you can create something of great beauty and lasting worth. And indeed, if you do it once, you should be able to do it again. Well, the, the, the metaphor is really to the workplace, that we're all different, many, many different ways. The mortar is the environment, uh, the, the, the tone and practices of the places we work in. And then, of course, the gestalt is, once we've brought all this together, we have great creativity. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not too surprising when you think about it a little bit more in depth that Walmart, of all places, is now backing affirmative action in the Supreme Court decision. Why? Because even they realize that difference is important in having a healthy and productive workplace. I don't know if you know about it or not, but the, there is a gay, lesbian, bisexual group through Walmart that's supported by the organization. For all of its faults, at least they understand something about diversity. Uh, this particular graphic comes from another book, and it comes from a personal experience. Uh, years ago when I was at Arkansas, we had a group in to uh, accredit our engineering program. And the chancellor and I went to the exit interview, and we walked into a room with a large conference table, and there were 13 white males sitting around the conference table. So here we see these white guys, uh, all the same, and the topic for today is diversity. Well, if uh, anybody needed it, uh, that group needed it. That's why it's, that's important. So, crafting the li living mosaic through leadership, tone and practices, and transforming all players. Commitments to sustainability and understanding science. I'm, I'm so sorry, I never got a chance to meet Carl Sagan. He died in the state of Washington in Seattle of cancer uh, at the Hutchinson uh, Medical Center. But he wrote in Cosmos and also in Broke His Brain, Many of the problems facing us may be soluble only if we're willing to embrace brilliant, you hear him say it, brilliant, daring and complex solutions. Such solutions require brilliant, daring, and complex people. And those are people who understand science. Science is really important as a backdrop to practically everything we do in the modern world. Uh, and will certainly be very important in terms of climate change, energy, food and fiber, health, water, the great issues of the 21st century uh, portrayed here by uh, Dusty. I love the scarecrow here, he's holding a thermometer and then he's putting his finger up and saying, well, am I, is my finger correct? <laughs> <laughs> he's doing a little experiment. And then personal responsibility. I don't know if any people in the audience know Frank Church, who was a wonderful senior senator from the state of Idaho. Uh, he was a great opponent of the Vietnam War. Uh, he, uh, whether you care for that idea or not, is not important. He did a lot of other wonderful things when he was in the Senate. And he had a, uh, a son, uh, F. Forrest Church, who became a Unitarian minister uh, who died of cancer actually just a few years ago. Uh, but he said that to be fulfilled, we need to recognize all of us that the world doesn't owe us a living. Rather, we owe the world a living. And in the brief time given to us, we somehow have to learn to give ourselves away. Uh, Forrest the Church is a one, wonderful person. He's written lots of books. Uh, if you have a chance to read one of them or more of them, you'll, you'll enjoy them greatly. So that not, a notion of determination and persistence, priority consciousness, critical thinking, complex reasoning, all part of what we try to begin uh, in our, F, uh, in our uh, first year experience courses. And then of course managing one's time. And this is TikTok man. Uh, Toto's coming with his ball saying, hey, it's time for me to be fast. So, so we talked about uh, the story. We talked about learning and wisdom. Uh, we talked about uh, Dorothy. And I always uh, end with, uh, with some final message. Everybody know the name, the word lanyap? Lanyap, lanyap. It's a Cajun word, uh, comes from the Acadians. The Acadians were the first to arrive in the New World, not the Pilgrims. They landed in 1604 on Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. And when the British took over Nova Scotia, they persecuted the Acadians, they left, they went to New York, they went primarily to New Orleans, and so they were called Acajan, Cajuns. And so the Cajun word lanyard comes from the French. If you were in medieval France and you went to the, the, the market and bought some grain, the vendor of the grain would take a little parcel of cloth parcel out the grain into your basket and at the end grab a little extra grain and say, pull it up for the cloth. 
the cloth had taken some grains along the way. So it's a little something extra. Here's some little something extras. You need to find things out for yourself. This was Glenda. Glenda's message throughout uh, the original book and the, actually not the original book, that was the, uh, but she does reinforce that later on in the original book. By the way, when you see the prequel this spring, Oz the Great and Powerful, you're going to be illuminated about a number of things. Uh, the China people, for example, literally made out of China, going back to uh, Frank Baum's experience selling China and glassware. You'll see that. I've seen some of the, the, the uh, early uh, clips of it. Uh, Mariah Carey would say many years later, uh, the hero lies in you. It, it cost $100 to quote that line in the book. <laughs> <laughs> for anything that involves intellectual property. <laughs> I didn't say much about Matilda Gage. Matilda was a great woman. That was uh, Frank's mother-in-law. Uh, she is very underrated. She was a confidant and a collaborator with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And she wrote the trilogy on woman suffrage. She doesn't get credit for it. She was kind of a tough woman, very outspoken. She was very interested in the anthropology of the Iroquois nation, which had some elements in it that were very, very important back in the 19th century. And because of her outspokenness, a lot of people didn't like her. And some people have suggested maybe she was the Wicked Witch of the West. The Wicked Witch of the East might have been Frank Baum's wife. Uh, they had some tough times uh, during uh, their lifetime. There's some interesting stories. But she had, she said to her grandchildren, particularly the, the, the uh, girl children, you have to do it for yourself. Look out for your own soul for life. And then, of course, I always like to quote Gwendolyn Brooks, the first African-American to win the Pulitzer Prize, exhaust a little moment, soon it dies, and be a gash of gold. It will not come again in this identical disguise. We will never do this again. We will never have this opportunity to share these thoughts in this room again. And so treasure all of your moments in your lives. Life comes to an end for all of us. And Fini, uh, in Greek, uh, Dorothy is Dorothea, uh, is a gift of God. Uh, in the Greek, uh, Dorothy Gale, note the last name, uh, he, he gave her a name that was related to the tornado, is a gift of Elfrane Baum. Dorothy in the way of Oz is my See on the yellow brick road of life, long life. So, so, all with a future focus. So we were able to save a few moments uh, for questions, uh, comments, and, uh, impressions. Tell me what you think. We should we put this into a first year experience course? Yes. Can you say some more about uh, the presentation you did down in Brazil? I'm really interested in how. Oh, sure. Happens. Be happy to. I have a follow-up. Yeah. Fortaleza and Recife are in the northeast. Yes. They're the capital cities, the wealthiest part of those provinces. But those are relatively poor provinces compared to Sao Paulo or Rio or the south. Yeah. And all those books that you mentioned in the beginning. No Portuguese in Contra. I doubt that, you know, with the wealth of people. How, how could you get the books for well, the wealth of let, people? Let, let me share a little bit of that experience. I, I have been to Sao Paulo. I, I did visit Sao Paulo last year, and I visited Vitoria, of course, up in the Northeast as well. Uh, we have a program through Texas Tech University Independent School District. We are tied into a consortium in Brazil, and it's a consortium of principally private schools. And the private schools offer to the children uh, a Portuguese diploma and a U.S. diploma in English based on our own Texas uh, uh, TEA uh, or uh, approved curriculum. They have to take the STAR exam, that's the new exam, and they score at 90 to 95% passing that. They are wonderful young people, they're mature, they're uh, intelligent, they have great proficiency in English, and in essence what their family, and obviously they're coming from well-to-do families, it's very expensive, but these are the future leaders of Brazil, because they're going to be Google, not only good in Portuguese, but they also are great in English and having a great experience. We're trying now to recruit these young people as graduates to come up here to take a baccalaureate degree at Texas Tech, and now we are in 40 schools in Brazil. 
uh, we will have 2,200 students in our program come in the spring. Now, we don't run these schools. They're run by some cases by the nuns, some cases by other organizations. They're pretty much uh, secular type organizations, even though they may have a Christian-oriented name associated with them. The, one of the biggest schools we're in is, is the uh, Dante Alighieri School in, uh, in Sao Paulo. Uh, and there are 20,000 schools uh, in Brazil, high schools. We're in 40 of them. But we have the preeminent uh, program now for English language high school diplomas that will allow these young people to go any place in the world. We'd love to have as many of them come here to Texas Tech being proficient in English but coming out of a very different culture be able to share that uh, with our students. So that's the reason I was there and I hope maybe I go back next year as well. And I will go to Rio and I'm trying to go to Florida as well. Other questions? Comments? Yes. I'm, I'm, I come from the generation that had the Wizard of Oz playing, uh, what was it, every Sunday? Was it Easter Sunday? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I can't remember. But Thanksgiving. Anyway, Thanksgiving. Anyway, I, so I, I'm very, very familiar with the Wizard of Oz, but I have uh, two daughters, 17 and 21, who are not as familiar with the Wizard of Oz. What are you thinking about doing to kind of familiarize them with the Wizard of Oz? Well, one thing that, uh, Elena, one thing that people don't know is the, the movie was, even though it was one of the ten nominations for best movie in 1939, we know Gone with the Wind was the winner, but uh, it was really not very popular in the late 30s or early 40s. It really took a librarian, as Rob knows well. Uh, in 1956, uh, there was a librarian at Columbia University, and actually now I have a copy of that brochure, uh, in my possession uh, that did an exhibit on L. Frank Baum and The Wizard of Oz because it was the 100th birthday of L. Frank Baum's birth. And that's when it took off. That's when the TV station started playing The Wizard of Oz, the movie, every year, year after year after year. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, and actually, as we see more things now, there is a, a, wiz there's a Wizard of Oz play now that uh, uh, Frank, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Lloyd Webber did, uh, and uh, I saw it in London a year ago. It's wonderful. It'll come to the U.S. Wicked sort of plays up on the themes. Uh, I've seen Wicked in New York and London, and it's a wonderful play, and it's derivative, but there are a lot of things that relate to the Oz sequels in it. And then this Oz, The Great and Powerful, is coming out in March. That will generate some more interest. There's a play, actually a multimedia production in South America called Magico Diaz. I saw it in, uh, in Vitoria last year in Portuguese, and it's literally multimedia. It's films, uh, 3D films, it's uh, live action, it's singing and dancing, and real things that happen to you. When they go to the, the Wicked Witch of the West Castle, they blow snow on you. Uh, when you when Dorothy comes into Munchkin Land from Kansas, quote unquote, uh, rain comes down on you. Uh, it's a really phenomenal experience. So if you ever are any place and see Magico Diaz, uh, make sure you go and see. And they're doing it in Spanish as well, uh, in places like Argentina and Chile. And so I think there will be a resurrection or resurgence of interest in the book and and I'm hoping also people that read it may pick up the original book pick up some of the sequels a lot of people have given me that kind of feedback and said yeah it's kind of interesting I haven't read the book I have to read it now and it's all all the books are free you can get them on online you can download them you can read all the 13 sequels in the original book for nothing well, very much part of our culture. Yeah, absolutely. And there's all kinds of allusions to Oz. I, I estimate maybe there's a billion people have seen the film. Uh, why do you think it took so long initially for it to take off? Why, why did, did it take till his 100th birthday? I, I think what happened there, Austin, is what happened also with some of the productions. Uh, I, I have a moment, maybe I'll have a, a moment to share with you. Uh, Frank Baum did a multimedia production uh, in 1908 and because uh, he was an actor he had written plays and so forth and he did a production where he would come out onto a stage dressed very elegantly behind a podium uh, there would be a live orchestra that Louis Gottschalk would would conduct and he would have a screen like this 
and where he could do stills, and he could also show movies. They had movies back in 1908. And he could do stop-action film where he could essentially mimic people coming out of the, 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 the screen, and then he had actors dressed up so that he could escort them and then talk about his book. It was phenomenal. He lost his shirt on it. That's where he went bankrupt, because it was so expensive. But what came out of it, he, and it ended in New York, and around Christmas time of 1908, and what happened was that, and what uh, scholars have commented about, is that people were not quite interested in things that had a, a kitty view to them back in those years. Mm -hmm. Also in the, in the 30s and 40s, we had not anthropomorphized enough. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had Disney enough. I was reminded, <laughs> this, this, I don't know you know this song, uh, Brazil. Well, that was actually in this Amigo Saludos film that was an, a, a, a uh, it was an animated film that Disney produced in 1940 because we were having trouble with relations in South America. And Nelson Rockefeller, of all people, organized a team of people that went down to South America to show this film and get people interested and in reinforcing their interest in, in uh, South America, particularly in Brazil, because they were worried about the Nazis coming in. And, and that's, by the way, why my father was there. My father was in Fortaleza and Recife back in World War II as a Navy shipman because we were trying to reinforce that relationship. Brazil was an ally trying to make sure that the Nazis wouldn't take over South America. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the, the answer to your question, Austin. I think there was a time when people didn't like kid stuff so much. Now yeah. I think Fantasia changed that, although mm -hmm. Fantasia is a very, a very advanced film for Disney. Mm -hmm. And but we didn't have all the animation. We didn't have all the things. Now we go and see all kinds of animated uh, films as adults and enjoy them. Okay. Okay. We probably run out of time. Thanks so much. Thank you.